All right, so hello and welcome back. So we're going to keep going. We're going to do part two of the main uh, reasons why Germany lost uh, World War II, or oil, um, by tick. And we will continue to go, and maybe we'll finish at part two, or maybe a part three. We will shall see. Otherwise, check the video in the description uh, for the stuff. And then if you click that video and you actually go to the video, you will see all the sources, which I recommend you go read and double check and verify. Um, if you are curious in anything that he says or want to rebuke it or whatever. Um, also, there's my Patreon and all that stuff there. Also, thanks to the Patreon members because they make this stuff possible. Otherwise, let's get to it. If you read Guderian, you will know that Hitler's decision to turn south during Barbarossa cost the Germans the time needed to take Moscow. This was often seen as a mistake. No, no, it wasn't. If Germany succeeds in taking Moscow, that is obviously a grave disappointment for us, but it by no means disrupts our grand strategy. Germany would gain accommodation, but that alone will not win the war. The only thing that matters is oil. As we remember, Germany kept harping on about her own urgent oil problems in her economic bargaining with us from 1939 to 1941. So we have to do all we can, A, to make Germany increase her oil consumption, and B, to keep the German armies out of the Caucasus. That's a speech by Timoshenko in November of 1941. The Soviets will not surrender if Moscow falls, just like Russia did not surrender in 1812 against Napoleon. Hitler deemed Moscow to be, quote, not very important, and actually wanted to concentrate forces to the south. Halder did not want to do that, and subsequently the High Command did not do that, favouring the Moscow Axis. Striking south makes more sense, and not just for the oil. Since the British blockade precluded the importation of additional foodstuffs from outside Europe, Germany faced a bitter prospect, as in 1917-18, of food shortages, hunger and political upheaval. Worryingly, Belgian miners had already gone on strike in the winter of 1940-41 to protest the meagre food supplies. While on the 1st of May 1941, German civilians had to face a drastic reduction in their own rations. The okay, break this down. The miners in Belgium did in fact go on strike because of their shit rations. They weren't getting many calories. Now, other parts that were not Germany would have all of their food shit. I mean, if they got food at all. Okay, let's be very frank here. If they got food at all, it would be lucky. Um, Germany kept most of the food for themselves. The average calorie count for a German was around 2,000. Minimum. Never really went below that. Um, and the whole reason that was that way was because of the stab in the back myth. Basically, Hindenburg uh, said that the people, Germans and Jews, in 1918, stabbed the country in the back by basically making them surrender when they could have won. This is a myth. Never fucking happened. And it was ridiculous from the start. Now, that is going to impact what Hitler does. He realizes that he will absolutely, under every single circumstance, need to keep the German population happy, fed, and give them... The shit they need so they don't rebel against him. That is his primary goal. That is what their entire thing was. That's why Goering did more butter rather than more guns after France fall. Okay? Didn't shift to a complete military production, went to more butter so that the population won't rebel. That is why it is like that. So again, I don't totally agree that <laughs> they were facing um, that uh, there was... Is that the prospect that the, that the Germans faced a bitter proposition as in 1917 that food, the food shortages and hunger and up, political upheaval? That, mm, I don't particularly agree with that statement. The miners, I do. Okay. And then the drastic reduction was probably a few hundred calories. It's not like they're fucking starving to death. That's not going to happen in this war because the high command and Hitler know that's what happened in World War One, and that's one of the fucking reasons they lost. German civilians had to face a drastic reduction in their own rations. The Ukraine was a central target as well as the Caucasus, which was also a fertile food production area. On the strategic level, most of the goals were in the south, 
the Ukraine and the Caucasus. It makes little sense then that Halder and his staff decide to concentrate in the north and center. The G Okay, let's break this down. Yes. Again, one of the reasons that they went for Ukraine was because of their grain. It is one of the grain baskets of Europe. Even today, with Russia fighting Ukraine, fucking grain exports, I don't need to tell you that it's bad and prices for food are going up, okay? Um, that's one of the reasons they went for Ukraine, okay? It's one of the, that makes strategic sense. You need the food. <clears throat> so not only can you feed the German people, you can feed everyone else that you have occupied. And the oil. Because you don't have any oil, you need to take the oil. Now... German leadership. Not, well, let's, let's take a look again. Level, most of the goals were in the south, the Ukraine and the Caucasus. It makes little sense then that Halder and his staff decide to concentrate in the north and center. The G it makes little sense from a strategic perspective on the fact of resources, but it makes perfect logical sense for Halder and the German general staff because they have four months to win this war. They don't win this war in four months, it's over. They think, after the Battle of France, that if they take Moscow, same shit will happen, Soviets will collapse, four months, even if we go past it a little bit, we should be fine, we get all the resources, we win, okay? That is what their fundamental understanding of this war is going to mean. However, that is throwing the economics and the, and the strategic situation out the, out the window. German military leadership, in fact, displayed a woeful lack of understanding of economic factors by training and tradition focused almost exclusively on the operational tactical aspects of planning. The OKH designed a plan based on the lessons of the 1940 French campaign that emphasized a swift, decisive, concentric thrust towards the enemy capital, unconcerned by the fact that the economically vital regions lay in the south. And again, just as I said, it makes perfect logical sense for a general staff and the officer corps that do not focus on logistics, that focus on the tactical and the planning side and the element of initiative and leadership, less on logistics, to base it off of, off of France falling to do that in Russia. It makes logical sense for them to go for Moscow on a strategic level at that sense. Now, it doesn't make sense that economically at fucking all, but again, there's two different sides to that. It's worth noting that after World War II, Halder is the advisor at the US Army Historical Division and is the central figure influencing the post-war German narrative of the war. He's the guy the other generals are going to and he's the one who is coming up with the narrative that says Hitler was the, the cause of all of Germany's blames and mistakes during the war. Halder and his generals are not going to admit their own mistakes and when you read the early World War II histories, the ones most people are familiar with, because that is the post-war narrative, they show that Moscow was the correct route, and Halder was right and Hitler was wrong. This is basically just to blame Hitler and get themselves off of it. Okay, generals, you know, tell the fucking time. They don't want to be wrong, because if they're wrong, you know, that looks bad. They don't get the paychecks, blah, 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 blah. Can't be bit looking bad, okay? And it's easy to blame it on the dead man that made that was a homicidal fucking maniac, right? Just blame him and all the problems go away. Reluctantly, Hitler gave in to the urging of Braukitsch, Halder and Bock and consented to the resumption of the drive on Moscow, but too late. This quote comes after a few pages of constantly going on about how Hitler made the wrong decision to turn south and how Halder was so right. This is why Guderian is saying how bad the decision to turn from Moscow and help the Army Group South was. Hitler said that the raw materials and agriculture of the Ukraine were vitally necessary for the future prosecution of the war. He spoke once again of the need of neutralizing the Crimea, that Soviet aircraft carrier for attacking the Romanian oil fields. For the first time, I heard him use the phrase my generals know nothing about the economic aspects of war. Hitler's words all led up to this. He had given strict orders that the attack on Kiev was to be the immediate strategic objective and all actions were to be carried out with that in mind. I here saw for the first time a spectacle with which was later to become very familiar. All those present nodded in agreement with every sentence that Hitler uttered while I was left alone with my point of view. But Guderian is wrong and is alone in his point of view because, as Hitler says, he doesn't understand the strategic and economic aspects 
of the war. And the best part is, Halder is actually awarded the Meritorious Civilian Service Award in 1961 for helping the US military in their historical research. So yeah, Halder and his cronies paint a completely biased picture of the war, blame Hitler for bad decisions even though they weren't, show themselves in as good a light as possible even though they in fact made the bad decisions, and then also then gets awarded for doing so. But apparently when you try and point this out to people, you get branded a revisionist. Yep, that's exactly what happens. Um, and it's perfectly logical sense that all of that, I mean, all what he just made, I fucking basically completely agree with, right? Generals wrote their shit, they're like, Hitler was fucking stupid. And the thing was, the German officer corps, fun fact, generals, again, today it's a little different for the US Army and again, different officer corps, okay? We do talk about the economics and logistics of things somewhat, but, again, that's not their primary fucking job. Their primary job is basically to win on the battlefield. That's really it. They're not thinking the long-term strategy. There are very few generals that will do that. And a lot of them are in acquisitions and then, you know, procurement and all of that stuff, okay? But, again, as I have already stated, the German officer corps was lugged down on logistics guys out the ass. And you know, this is the result. No, the German sources are biased, just like the Soviet sources. And they are twisting the facts to manipulate the way you perceive the war. And just to point out, there's no such thing as a revisionist historian. Historian, by definition, looks at the sources and questions them. If they don't do that, well, you're not a historian. Anyway, so how the... I do agree with... If you don't question the sources, you're not a historian, right? You have to question your sources and look at it. Like, again... It is a. I can go get my fucking uh, my book from. Uh, you know what? I'll go do that. Stand by. Okay, so I found it. Um, as he was saying, any good historian must question their sources, right? Because if you don't, you're not really a fucking historian. So this whole book right here is literally just sources from the time period. Okay, the Weimar Republic source book edition, edited by Anton Cass, Martin J. Edward Dimberg. Right here it is. Now. <laughs> fucking crisis that whole book is just sources from the contemporary time you as a historian need to decipher who they are trying to persuade at the time who do they benefit you know you can't just take a fucking primary source like the stab in the back myth right it is in that book and be like yeah he was just he just said that so it's primary source blah 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 that's just correct no it's not why did he say that? Where was he during that, right? Was he in the parliament building? Blah, blah, blah. You do all the fucking background research on those primary sources. Now, him saying that there's no such thing as a revision historian is more one of Tick's more spicy comments. I don't agree. There are revision historians that will take a fucking well-known established fact and be like, huh, I'll question this and be like, it's a fucking not that way, it's the other way. And they have no evidence to actually back up their argument. If they did have evidence to back up their argument, then they are doing their job. But they don't usually. They just fucking pick one thing and then try to make it whatever. Long story short, as a revisionist history thing, and blah, 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 blah. Let's continue. The and the German general's narrative of the war is biased towards the Moscow axis and is painting Hitler as a madman. No, going towards Moscow is a terrible decision. So tight were fuel rations that in November 1941, Opel was forced to shut down production at its Brandenburg plant, Germany's largest truck factory, because it lacked the petrol necessary to check the fuel pumps and of vehicles coming off the assembly line. A special allocation of 104 cubic meters of fuel had to be arranged by the Wehrmacht's economic office so as to ensure that there was no further interruptions. The German economy is on its last legs. The German Wehrmacht is critically short of fuel despite having absolute priority. It runs out of fuel in October and November 1941. The Germans in fact reach the Caucasus and take Rostov in 1941 but are thrown back during the Soviet winter counter-offensive. Interestingly, the terrible German logistics actually plays into their favour, as Hayward points out, because the backlog of fuel trains ends up clearing in December and fuel therefore does get to the front, which allows the German army to fight on through the winter months. That's just, that's like being so inept that it proves to your benefit. But essentially, from this point on, the Germans are now 
not able to wage the war that they had before. They can no longer advance on a broad front like they did during 1941. They would only have enough fuel to supply one German army group. This is why Moscow isn't taken in 1942. Instead, Hitler sends his panzers south. This is his last chance to find oil. And that's the, uh... So army group north, center, south, right? You can only supply one of them. South's going to be it, according to Hitler, to secure, you know, economic resources to basically continue this fucking war. Case Blau and Stalingrad is Hitler's absolute last chance of winning the war. He even says, if I do not get the oil of Maykop and Grozny, then I must end the war. And he was right. Fuel too was in such short supply that the Wehrmacht High Command in 1942 cut the fuel ration to the oust hair considerably, a blow to its mobility accentuated by the serious loss of horses. The OKW warns in June of 1942 that the army will have no choice but to partially demotorize. Yes, demotorize. Those of you who say that the Germans didn't have enough tanks or trucks or equipment, you're half right. They actually did have enough tanks. Tank numbers were greater in 1942 than in 1941, and again in 1943 compared to 1942. The problem is that they don't have enough petrol to run the ones that they've got already. Tell and it's not just that. They don't have enough petrol to run the ones they have already. They don't have enough petrol to run the training units in Germany for the new recruits that to replace the guys that are dying so they don't really know how to operate the vehicles or take care of them and they're shipped to the front in vehicles that they're not really trained in and catastrophic losses occur. Tellingly, at a time when the Soviets were rapidly rebuilding and mechanizing their forces, the Wehrmacht was in the process of re-equipping its reconnaissance units with bicycles. This demodernization of the oust hair did not bode well, given that the success of the campaign, depending on seizing objectives more than 800 miles from the German start line, an operational and logistic challenge greater than that of the previous summer. A lot of people, including historians, say that the Germans were aiming for Baku. The Germans don't actually need to take Baku, they just need to take Mayakop and Grozny, and technically, they do get to them, but they only manage to extract 750 tons of crude oil from them per month before they're forced back. I didn't know that. There you go. Um, if they again, I'll, I'll trust his judgment on there. If they need those two, then they need those two. Um, but they weren't able to get again. They weren't able to get much out of them, as I stated before. If they get blown up, if they're sabotaged, it takes many months to get them back up, and then they just fucking lose them anyway. So they do get to them, but they only manage to extract 750 tons of crude oil from them per month before they're forced back. But this is Hitler's last chance. He's now at war with Britain and the Soviet Union, which is bad enough as it is, but he's also now at war with the United States, the leading oil power of the world. America's trucks, tanks, planes, trains. They sent a lot of trains to the Soviet Union, which may have been more important than the trucks they sent. And vast quantities. Which is true, right? Um... I've been getting a lot of flack for my point on the lease, but I will say this. The war ended shortly, shorter, and a lot more lives were saved because of the lend lease program that the United States gave to the Soviets. As you see here, we gave lend lease to fucking everyone, not just the Soviets. So, again, also Hitler didn't have to declare war on the U.S. That was just fucking stupid and absolutely retarded. His foreign minister said that was retarded. He didn't have to do that. You know, I mean, it's not like the United States wasn't going to come into war with Germany eventually. It would have taken longer, which might have given them a fucking chance. Maybe. Probably not. But it was monumentally stupid to declare war on the EU anyway. Um, but yes, the lend helped the Soviets uh, win the war a few years earlier. Tease of all their equipment. Well, they're on the way. And unlike the Germans, the Allies have the fuel to run them. It's just a matter of time. Hitler knows this and knows his only chance to fight against the material superiority that's heading his way is to capture the oil in the Caucasus. If he gets the oil, his economy will be saved and he would have the resources of continental Europe at his disposal. He would have the fuel to motorize and mechanize his army and the panzers would have the fuel they need to actually 
fight. The Blitzkrieg would be back on, but he only has a narrow window of opportunity to take the oil. This is why it was vitally important that the Caucasus be taken in 1942, and why the Stalingrad campaign is important too. There's two aspects to this plan of Hitler's as well. The first is to get the oil at Maykop and Grozny. The second is to cut the Soviets off from Baku. Now he can't get to Baku, but what he can do is block the Volga. Perhaps they shouldn't have gone into the city of Stalingrad, but sat south of it on the Volga and just prevented the oil tankers from heading north. And uh, well, we'll leave the tactical decisions behind this uh, debate for another day. But if the Germans cut the Volga, the Soviet Union would be crippled. The now that is true. As he suggested, they didn't actually have to take Stalingrad very simple now I, later in videos he will talk about like the baku could just you know fucking send oil up here um via this way and by the railway that they had because the germans didn't actually fucking get around here because they they tried and they got like around here and then they just kept shipping oil up here but again it's not a bad plan the reason stalingrad had to be taken is very simple it's the largest fucking city here and if you take it you have a supply base all the fucking railheads go to stalingrad all of everything goes here if you can take this position, you have a very good strategic position, not only to hold the city, but also all the rail hubs and everything lead there. But if you sit outside of it and along the Volga River and you can cut off the oil from Baku, neither you nor them are getting it, so it does give them a critical um, shortage. But again, taking this was absolutely vital. They couldn't do it, again, because they went for fucking Moscow. But, again. Hey, but if the Germans cut the Volga, the Soviet Union would be crippled. The loss of the Caucasus would deprive the Soviet Union of half of its oil reserves and 80 to 90% of its crude oil production, refinery output and pipeline capacity. Meanwhile, severing the transit lines along the Volga would eliminate the most effective means of moving oil to central Russia from either the Caucasus, covering a distance of 1,200 kilometers on average to reach its domestic consumers, or the Volga Urals, the second Baku. With that. And that is true. Now, whether the U.S. will be able to cover this demand, probably, um, but it would definitely be a very critical hit to the Soviets. Either way, if they lost it, even if the U.S. is able to make it up in oil shipments to them, still be bad. Without oil and without food, and by the way, the Soviets were getting hungry already thanks to the loss of the Ukraine, the Soviet war... And because of the Great Famine that happened in the 30s, because of the fucking five-year plans that kept happening... So yeah, the Soviets were very fucking hungry. Our effort would be in a dire situation. This would have given Hitler the oil he needed to keep fighting and deprive the Soviets of the oil and food they needed to fight effectively. Germany would have been placed in the best position, the best chance of winning, if they'd taken the Caucasus and cut the Volga. Now, I do agree with him on that. That would have given them the best possible position. If they had taken the Volga, taken Baku... And they have the Ukraine that is the best position they could be to win the war. Do they win the war? Probably fucking not. Um, but the war probably goes on longer. And maybe the Soviets collapse. Maybe they don't. I don't know. That's a, that's an alt history question. This was Hitler's last real gamble. This is why the Stalingrad campaign is a turning point. It may not be the big turning point of the war. Arguably, that may have already happened. And we'll ask that question you know, what was the big turning point of the war in another video, but if he... Uh, I think he, he, there are there are different timelines you could do for the turning point. You could do Moscow in 41, not taking it. You could do Stalingrad in 42, not taking it. You could do Kursk if you really want to go that far. I don't think so. I really do think it's probably fucking Moscow in 41. Um, maybe Stalingrad, maybe. But by, by then, I mean, it's still a fighting war, so we lost, um, obviously, but the Lend lease starts to get the British Lend lease is fully going, and the U.S. is by the end of '42 starting to get off its ass and give the Soviets shit because again we hate communists and we'd rather give it to everyone else. So Hitler had won this fight in 1942. It's likely that the Soviets would have collapsed in 1943, 1944. German economic assessments of the Soviet Union's precarious economic situation in early 1942 also had some merit. The Soviet economy was in fact on the verge of collapse due to the loss 
of numerous economic and raw materials assets during Operation Barbarossa. Moreover, the Soviet Union was already dependent by 1942 on lend lease assistance, especially food and specialty petroleum products such as high octane gasoline. Consequently, there is every reason to think that the loss of the Caucasus would have rendered the Red Army combat ineffective within a year. Cutting the oil route north would mean that the Red Army would barely have enough reserves of oil to wage war in 1943 and probably would have paralysed what remained of Soviet agriculture production. And Stalin knows this as well. He tells Deputy Oil Commissar Nikolai Beyapikov that if he doesn't destroy the oil fields before the Germans capture them, he would be shot. <laughs> I was about to say, he will be shot, and I was right. Classic Stalin. The Soviets therefore ensure that the oil fields are destroyed, so thoroughly in fact that even the Germans were impressed by the effort they went to do it. The issue with the 1942 campaign was that, well it's off distance, the Germans simply don't have enough men and equipment to do the task. I'll be covering this in great detail in my upcoming Stalingrad documentary, but effectively the Germans and Axis allied forces are not capable of what was needed and they are defeated. When you read the accounts of German panzer formations advancing in this campaign, you hear how they keep running out of fuel. This means their attack on Stalingrad, for example, is often a stop-start affair as they're waiting for more fuel to catch up to them. Yes, logistics does play its part, but actually a lot of it is simply the fact that the Germans have run out of fuel. And as you said, they ran out of fuel by four months in, October. Right? They said two months, and they could make it stretch to four months. Um, and their backlog of fucking being in at logistics made it to December 41, even though they should have ran on in November, which they did. And then they got it back in December. But by late 42, you're pushing your tanks. You, I mean, you don't have oil. If you had oil and you did this in 41, maybe you could do this. But they don't have any oil, so they can't, they can't move. Now, some of you will be thinking that Germany carried on the war until 1945 and that its economy didn't collapse because of a lack of oil resulting from not ca capturing the Caucasus. This is true, but that doesn't mean they weren't chronically short of oil. Synthetic fuel allowed Germany to wage war but not to win it. Germany's economically illiterate generals scoffed at economic advisers who urged the conquest of the Caucasus by pointing out that Germany managed to carry on the war until 1945 without ever securing the Caucasus oil. But at no point after the failures of 1941-42 did Germany ever possess the opportunity to end the war on favourable terms. Rather, Axis Europe had to spend the rest of the conflict labouring under constant shortage of energy which constrained economic productivity and reduced military effectiveness. Hey. Now I agree with this professor, okay, on, on this specific part. Um, let's see. The, the, they were allowed to wage war, but they're not allowed to win it. Um, they managed to carry on the war until 1945 without ever securing the Caucasus, right? Um, but, and this is the part I really agree with, at no point after the failures of 41-42 did Germany ever possess the opportunity to end the war on favorable terms. That is 100%. Correct. Now, in 43, 44, maybe they could have ended the war, but they wouldn't have been on... Again, you have to think like Battle of the Bulge. Their whole fucking strategy was just to knock the... Was to get peace terms with the Allies. It wasn't even... It wasn't even to, like, turn them against the... Civil. Well, they want to do that. That's just fucking fantasy land. But maybe they could buy themselves some time, maybe negotiate, and be like, just take fucking France and leave us alone. That no position after 41 and 42 were they ever going to win this war. That shit was decided. It's just how many buys had to be fucking thrown at the problem to win. Again, that's like Kursk is an example of... Kursk is its own oxy-fucking-moron of a shit that happens, but it's one of those things that you know, Germany wasn't going to fucking break through at Kursk. And they did it, and they lost basically all of their fucking panzers they had left, really, in any formidable divisions on a concentrated front. Activity and reduced military effectiveness. Hayward also points out that the German economy didn't collapse and that even some of the economic reports about the lack of oil were a little bit exaggerated. However, there are reasons the Germans continue to fight. Italy defected to the Allies, so the Germans captured Italian oil reserves. They also ramped up synthetic oil production, which helped massively, although was never going to be enough. 
They're also fighting a mostly defensive war at this point, so fuel isn't getting used as much. There's also a reduction in the number of fighting vehicles. Some Luftwaffe training regimes were closed because of a lack of fuel, and the Luftwaffe as a whole was suffering from a chronic lack of fuel. Not only lack of fuel, lack of fucking pilots, lack of everything. They couldn't train their new pilots, they couldn't fly their own aircraft, they closed the training school, so everyone was just like, get the fuck in the plane, good luck bro. It was very, very bad. During the Battle of the Bulge, the Germans were relying on capturing Allied fuel stocks, and Piper even drove half-tracks through minefields to clear them, because, well, they run out of fuel. The weapons of war are useless when you don't have the fuel to run them, which is why it was a sound strategy to drive half-tracks over mines. And there's other examples, but essentially the economy didn't collapse until the US Air Force hammered the synthetic oil plants in late 1944 and 1945. And this whole oil crisis explains some of the other aspects of the war, including Hitler's standfast orders. And one of my professors goes against the traditional argument that strategic bombing doesn't really do shit. Um, and again, he's a fucking major in the US Army, so he has some, he has some credit there. He's also a historian. Because um, again, German production numbers actually went up during the last bit of the war, which was fucking amazing to me, even though they're being bombed at the shit. Um, bombing does have an effect. It just is not going to win you the war. It's not going to, it's not going to really do much to win you the war. It's going to hurt. But it's not going to win you the war. Um, that's why it stands on that. And one of the best examples you could do that is like we bombed the shit out of out of fucking Japan, right? They didn't surrender. And really, they're already out of resources, so what the fuck else are they going to do? I mean, we killed a lot of people, right? But the atomic bomb is what he says, that's a game changer. When you start dropping those, you either surrender or you're all blown off the face of the fucking earth, so. People don't seem to understand Hitler's standfast orders. His generals were the most vocal on this subject, even going so far as to call him mad. That argument is convincing from a tactical point of view, but not from a strategic point of view. Hitler says he either takes Meerkop and Grozny, or must end the war. Now, we have to think of tactically and strategically are two different things. Tactically is like a specific battlefield. Operationally is a, is a sector. Strategically is like a whole fucking front. So when he says he wants to hold fast order on this whole front, hold on the whole front is because they start fucking falling back. Doesn't really matter about the individual battles. I mean, it does, but it's not really. But the whole front needs to hold. If it doesn't hold, it, again, like you said, it's gonna be fucking over. And so he takes them and then holds on to them for dear life, hoping to simultaneously extract oil and starve the Soviets of oil. Where does he starve them of oil? The Volga at Stalingrad. Now, it can be argued that Stalingrad wasn't necessary for this. They could have gone south of the city and blocked the Volga there, and I agree. However, once committed at Stalingrad, Hitler's reasoning for standing fast in the Volga is kind of understandable. Not just from a tactical point of view, but from a strategic point of view. He's trying to block the oil shipments up the Volga. And not withdrawing from the Caucasus makes sense because he's trying to extract the oil. There's also the promise from Manstein who says he'll link up with the 6th Army. And then there's also Jezinek's indication that uh, the Luftwaffe could supply the 6th Army by air. Anyway, it turns out to be a complete disaster, as we know. After this, though, why stand fast? Well, let's not forget who Hitler was. He had fought in the First World War, and so he does not want to repeat the stab-in-the-back surrender that caused the Germans to lose World War I. After World War I, the German opinion was that the German army had not been defeated in the field, and had, in fact, been stabbed in the back by the government. Hitler. I wouldn't say it was the government, it was the people. At least from my fucking... Oh my god, this thing is fucking big. At least from my, my big fucking source book right here on the stab in the back myth. It wasn't really the, I mean, the government. Did their, they weren't helping, let's put it that way. But the fucking people was what they thought. And again, it is correct that the German army, they thought the stab in the back, but they weren't actually defeated. Which, by the way, they fucking were. They, their whole lines were shattered. Like, that last offensive broke the German army. Whether they want to fucking admit that or not is a different story. Having lived through that war, and having shared this opinion most vocally, 
is not willing to surrender in this second war for this reason. And in 1943 and 1944, the Germans are still fighting deep in Soviet territory. They are weak, but far from defeated. But now they have this critical oil crisis that prevents the movement of their motorized units. The German generals are suggesting that they should just move back in order to consolidate and then buy time for another counterattack. They're saying that they want to fight a maneuver war, and that's perfectly understandable. However, they are thinking from a tactical and operational point of view, not a strategic point of view. Their fuel supplies are inadequate. They can't fight the maneuver war that they want to. When you look... That's true. They're out of oil. They're like, cool, you want to fucking maneuver? Yeah, what are you going to do? Fucking push the tank? Again, maybe on a tactical and operational level, that makes sense, right? You can probably get enough fuel to scrape to, together like a division or so of oil and push, right? But strategically, like a whole army group, you don't have the fucking oil anymore. In 43, 44 especially, it just doesn't fucking exist. And you're just trying to hold what positions you have. Look at what Hitler's saying. I shouldn't have listened to my generals. He's right. They wanted to go to Moscow. They wanted Leningrad. They wanted to retreat. They were wrong. Generals like Manstein are relieved of command and replaced by generals who will stand and fight. About his dismissal, Manstein says that Hitler still had faith in him, but at the moment, however, there was no further scope for me in the East. The tasks now pending, uh, he considered Modal, who had stopped a difficult retreat in Northern Army Group to be especially suitable. Now, Modal is one of those guys that, like, is a fire commander, fire... <laughs> you basically throw him where everything is going to shit. He's very absolutely bad one of the best defensive commanders they have. Um, he will be used in Market Garden, and then um, somebody will be appointed over him so he can actually, because again, there's two different things. So Modal and Market Garden was used on a operational level to, you know, be, do his job and fucking stop the bleeding. And he wanted somebody to actually be appointed over him so that they, they could manage the strategic aspect of what the fuck was going on so he could actually concentrate on operational. But he's one of the best they have for defensive warfare. He goes on to say about the army group command he was handing over to Modal. Its only remaining commitment was to assist the fighting troops and give them moral support. That Modal would certainly be able to do. The Führer empathically agreed that Modal was a particularly suitable choice in this respect, as he would dash around the divisions and get the very most out of the troops. Manstein was the old maneuver warfare general, whereas Modal was the type of defensive general who would stand and fight to the last. This is why Modal was known as the Führer's fireman, because he was constantly putting out fires throughout the Eastern Front. As I alluded to, the fireman, that's a better fucking term for it. The point being that there was no fuel left to wage the maneuver war that Manstein was good at, and that the war had moved to an traditional defensive battle stage. Hitler recognized that, and he also couldn't surrender, as stated. So, really, what choice does he have other than to stand and fight? He's playing for time, because that's all he's got left, and he's hoping for miracles. That's not the thoughts of a madman. This is his only option. If he surrenders, he's dead. So he has to keep fighting. Given the situation strategically, this is his only option, and he's he's not mad for taking it. He's desperate, and he's clutching at straws, but he's not mad. The oil crisis dictates that this has to happen. I also think it's interesting that up until late 1942, Hitler is mostly willing to listen to his generals, and mostly willing to allow them to do what they think is best. Stalin is the opposite of this, and yet, during the Battle of Stalingrad, Stalin and Hitler seem to swap personalities. Hitler becomes less willing to listen to his generals, and less willing to allow them the freedom of action they want. Stalin does start listening to his generals, and does start allowing them to make their own decisions. It's as though both dictators realised at the same time that the tide had changed, that Hitler had lost the war and Stalin had won it. And it isn't just because of the fall of the Ukraine and the food or the coal or the other aspects. And it's not because the Wehrmacht was defeated. And that is true. Stalin, at the beginning part of this war, was a complete hands-on dude and refused to let generals do but basically fucking anything. He had to have overall command. Hitler 
most of the time listen to his generals unless he wanted to override that, right? Um, then after Stalingrad, as you said, they swapped. And for the rest of the war, Stalin kind of was hands-off with his army. I mean, he did operational big aspects that had to be approved by him, obviously. Um, but hands-off generally, Alpha Division and Corps Commanders kind of let them do what they thought would need to win. Meanwhile, Hitler went in the opposite direction and started to become more hands-on and started sacking guys and started putting only loyal puppets in places so that he would have direct command of everyone, basically, and not trust his general. It was because Hitler had not taken the oil and not won the oil rush, and he had spent his last energies trying to get there. Once this is realized, both seem to swap roles, and that to me is very interesting. There's obviously a lot of factors going on here, but... That change of personality indicates that the tide of war had changed. Now, of course, Hitler had been stubborn before this, and sometimes his decisions don't seem to make much sense on the surface, such as Dunkirk. Yeah, so Dunkirk. I'll see what he says on it. Why allow the British to withdraw from Dunkirk? Now... I'm going to hold my hand up in here and then just say that I'm only suggesting that this is a factor. And I'm not saying this is the absolute 100% the only reason for this. I'm only suggesting that this should be factored in to the debate about Dunkirk. Okay, I'm going to suggest that some of the historians who say that Hitler did it for political reasons because he is trying to appease Britain may have been right. Why would he try and appease Britain? Britain, by fighting on, is no real threat to Germany, at least not by itself. Its army is small, they're struggling in North Africa against the Italians and then later Rommel and his three divisions, and its air force is good but not able to seriously hurt Germany at this time. But what the British have is the Royal Navy, and Hitler knows what they'll do with it. No fucking blockade Germany and he'll be in a world of hurt. So. Blockade. Just like they do in the First World War, Germany is blockaded. Shipments of oil from the United States and Venezuela cease. And this is the ticking time bomb for Germany. This limits Germany's potential to win the war, resulting in the invasion of the Soviet Union. But if Hitler can appease the British or persuade them to come to peace, it would allow shipments of oil to keep coming into Germany and maybe buy him time to turn his army into the, a fully motorized and mechanized force. In this context, Dunkirk makes sense. Let's allow the British to withdraw, showing Britain that, hey, we don't want to fight you. Let's, let's go for peace, eh? This is Hitler trying to win the British over. But, of course, Churchill has none of it. Okay, fine, so let's threaten to invade and then put political and economic pressure on Westminster to peace out by bombing them and then sink their ships. Hitler doesn't need a victory, he just needs peace. Goebbels says he doesn't want at all to annihilate England nor destroy its empire, but we must have calm. Kirsch? And that is, from the, my aspect on researching this, this is true. They did not want the fuck, they didn't... They could care less, really. They just wanted peace with Britain. Obviously, on favorable terms, it would be fucking great. But they just wanted peace with Britain, right? They get peace with Britain, they can solve their oil problem, they can solve many of their fucking problems. They don't have to be so heavily dependent on fucking military shipments, all of that shit, okay? That's one of the reasons. As, again, he's just suggesting that oil came in to be a thing for one of the reasons that some historians think that it was a political decision to not attack Dunkirk. He's just suggesting... Oil was a part of that decision. Whether that actual decision is political or not is a different debate. But, on the whole, this makes sense logically. Shaw says, while he was at the Berghof, Hitler had talked with his military leaders about a possible invasion of Britain should his peace offer be rejected. At these discussions, an invasion was still seen as a last choice rather than a first option. As Richard Overy states, he was forced to attack the Soviet Union because Britain's stupid chiefs refused to make a sensible peace. Perhaps, he reflected, he should have struck south, seized Gibraltar, and swept into the Near East to smash British resistance. Dunk. That's fucking debatable. He was going to attack the Soviets if you read the god-awful book. My comp, he was going to do it either way. If the British didn't weren't at war with them, they would have been able to get the fucking oil from at least Venezuela. 
not the United States, maybe, but at least from Venezuela and some other countries to make up some some of that. But you know, Kirk, in this context, makes sense. Allow the British Army to withdraw. It's not really a threat anyway, and we don't really want to invade England. And then try and get the British to accept peace. Perhaps this is why Hitler stopped the Panzers. If the British can be persuaded to come to terms on the peace table, the blockade will be lifted and Germany will have access to more oil. Maybe this was for economic reasons. In his biography of Hitler, Kershaw suggests that this wasn't the case and that Dunkirk was in fact a purely military decision. In Shire's Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, he has a debate about it, citing our beloved Halder over and over again and seems puzzled when some generals suggest that Hitler was happy to let the British Empire live on. Halder, of course, says Hitler was at fault and that it was his military decision, although admits that there were second political decisions and reasons as well. Halder blames Goering and sides with Rundstedt, who says he wasn't the one who sided with Hitler, even though he did, and there's other generals as well that seem to be on Hitler's side on, in one account and then not in another, and it's a whole... The debate goes on. It's a massive mess. Just a massive cluster of fucking nowhere. And really, it does deserve a video on its own, but I'm going to suggest that Hitler had the oil situation in the back of his mind as well. And in that context, it, it adds weight to the idea that Hitler was trying to appease the British. In that sense, he does not need victory, he just needs peace. And he's talking about, again, he's just suggesting as one of the, one of the things for the specific case that they were trying to appease the British. Whether that appeasement was actually why they stopped Dunkirk is a different matter entirely. He's just suggesting one of the outcomes um, for the political reasons was the oil. But I would agree with that on that fact. Um, if you get peace with the British, I mean, you can start actually getting fucking resources and not be on 100% war material all the goddamn time. Again, I'm just suggesting that this was a factor, not necessarily the only factor. Right or wrong, though, I would love to hear your thoughts on this point, so let me know. 90% of the world oil supplies were controlled by the Allies. So deficient were the Axis powers of oil, they were willing to wage war to obtain it. This was the Axis Achilles heel. The British decision to keep fighting in 1940 results in a blockade of Europe that prevents oil from getting to Germany. Hitler is therefore forced to fight a war... This is the conclusion, by the way, so you sum up everything if you're a historian to defend your main argument. With the Soviet Union, which doesn't collapse in 1941 as expected, but keeps fighting, this forces Hitler to gamble in striking towards the Caucasus in 1942 in one last attempt to get to the oil that he needs to wage the war, and is prevented from doing so by what happens at Stalingrad. After this point, Hitler's only real choice is to fight, and buy him as much time as possible leading to an increasing use of standfast orders. Ultimately, Germany didn't need more panzers or trucks or submarines or planes because it couldn't run the ones it had. Oil is probably not the only factor, but it is a big one. When you think of World War II, you should think of oil. It explains the war, it explains why one side won and one side lost, it explains the post-war world, why Britain is no longer a superpower, but the Soviets and the USA are, and it explains many of the decisions made at the time, and even since. I would agree with that argument most of the part. The reason the British weren't a superpower is probably one of those very many factors. Empire's gone, no oil. I get, I get that, yeah. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Let me know below. And if this makes sense to you, share this video. Tell people, hey, this is why Germany lost the war. Thank you to my patrons for making this video possible. Your support allowed the purchase of the books I used in this video. You effectively made this video happen, so thank you for being awesome. A big shout out and a big thank you goes to Richard Stokes, who provided me with several articles from authors like Toprani, the guy doing a substantial amount of research on the oil situation in World War II. As a follow-up video to this video, I highly recommend the lecture video by Toprani, who goes into more detail about how oil shaped World War II, which you can find here and also in the pinned comment in the comment section below. I may check out that video if you got if this video one does well, which I, maybe it will. Um, but I don't know if there's that many historians that actually want to sit down with me and you know, go through all the viewpoints. But yeah, overall, 
again, I agree. Oil, if you think of World War II, you need to think of oil. If you think of oil and where it is, it is a major factor in basically every decision that needs to be made. Um, and yeah, he's a very good uh, historian. And again, this video is from four years ago. It's got some more spicy comments recently. Um, but overall, I do agree that oil is a main factor and you should check out this video. So if you like this shit, uh, give me a like with this video. Um, subscribe. It helps a lot because, uh, yeah. Otherwise, I'll see people next time.